Welcome to our weekly compilation. If you've happened to overlook any of our captivating stories, fret not as we've meticulously curated a unique collection with you in mind. Whether you're yearning to break free from boredom or purely aiming to make the most of your leisure moments, you've found yourself in the ideal spot. To guarantee that you stay updated with all our thought-provoking content, don't forget to become a subscriber to our platform and enable notifications. Attractive teachers, did you know which students had a crush on you, and what is the strangest or most inappropriate thing you overheard said about you? Story 1. Not a very lewd story, thank god, uh, but an actual experience and I suppose an actual answer to the question. I'm in my mid-twenties and I'm currently finishing up my education to become a teacher at what would be the equivalent of high school level in the US. However, over the course of my studies, I've had to teach a bunch of usually supervised classes. My subjects are computer sciences and history. About two years ago, I taught a class in computer sciences. Very basic stuff, not really what I want to be teaching, but I guess someone has to do it. So this class was split into two groups, which I taught separately on different days. The groups should have been split randomly, but by sheer chance, one group was 100% girls only, and the other was one predominantly male. I taught the same classes to both of these groups, mind you. Exactly the same stuff, same worksheets, etc., etc. Those kids were a bunch of teenagers around the age of 15, maybe 16. Now, I remember distinctly how surprised I was at the different outcomes from the, those two groups. Stereotypically, girls have a harder time with computer sciences. I don't mean this in a sexist way. In fact, I would see this as a result of a sexist society. But usually, the boys pick up on some things faster. Not in this case. The girl-only part of the class was effing focused to a point where I couldn't even provide enough worksheets to fill the lesson. What I remember the most about it was how they listened to everything I said. As a high school level teacher, this is not something you're used to. You usually just hope that like 25% of what you say somehow finds its way into their minds. But these girls picked up on everything I said, asked questions, and seemed really interested in the subject. So I told a couple of female friends of mine about this. I was praising this class a la, isn't this great? This just smashes the stereotypical way of thinking. This is what happens when you give female students a chance to excel in something that our society doesn't usually associate with women, blah blah blah. All of these female friends looked at me at once and went, dude, they're into you. You're a 23... You're a 24-year-old, decent-looking substitute teacher. You're the dream. I wouldn't have any of that. Surely a bunch of 15-year-old girls couldn't be interested in a teacher almost a decade older than them. Well, all of that got crushed when I finished the last lesson that I taught in that class. When I was packing my things, a group of these girls walked over to my desk and sheepishly asked what I was doing after school and whether I would come back to their school at any time. The disappointment when I told them that I probably won't come back wasn't the kind of disappointment you get when the students really enjoyed your classes. It was the disappointment of teenage girls with a crush. On the plus side, my supervisor gave me stellar feedback on those lessons. Told me he never saw the class this engaged. <sighs> I mean... I know what it's like. I do these videos, I give my comments, opinions, and advice. But I feel like people are just here for the the pretty face of a of a middle-aged <laughs> bald guy with a mustache who wears flamboyant shirts. Uh, ladies, gentlemen, hi. But only if you're 18 or older. Uh, no, scratch that. Only if you're like 25 or old or older, at least. I'm sorry. I just. Uh. And also, only if you're my partner, Madam Facts. So really, hi to no one. So I, she's. I mean, she's right through the office. I'm almost kind of looking where she would be right now. Hi, dear. What am I doing? Story two. When I was around 25, I used to substitute, and it was mainly at a pretty affluent high school. There were girls who would come to my room between classes just to hang around and talk. Then there was the girl who wanted me to read her poetry. The funniest thing was the drama class I subbed for where they didn't even try to be subtle. It was a very loosey-goosey class anyway in the school's theater. There were three girls who crowded around me the whole class and were asking for my phone number and my address because they wanted to come hang out. I told them we couldn't. 
One day, I was at the mall with a buddy of mine, and a group of high school girls saw me and came running up to me, kind of hanging on and around me and talking. My friend shot me a look. I mouthed a silent, I swear I haven't touched them. I met a guy around that time, he was kind of a jerk, who was bragging about secretly dating a high school girl from that school. He was mid to late 20s. When he found out I subbed there, he said, Oh, you're the substitute with the goatee they're always talking about. You're kind of a legend with those girls. You should hook up with some. I soon decided to stop substituting. Good on you and bad on creepy mid to late 20s guy. Gross. Like, I don't even care if they're 18 and like seniors in high school. It's still just... Folks, you'll get it. If you're in high school, I promise, there just there comes a point where you get into your 20s and the separation of just a few years becomes this massive gulf. It really is there. And if it's not there for some folks, it's a little worrying to me. Like, and and it's nothing against you if you're 18. I was 18. We're all 18. Everyone goes through it, and you're certainly much more adult than a 14 or 15-year-old, but it's not the same. Story 3. Male teacher here. I've had a number of students who I've found out had crushes on me. They're usually the ones who find any reason possible to be around you, but on top of that, I've had some more obvious signs. One girl ran into class and jumped into my lap while I sat behind my desk and nestled down a bit. I'm not allowed to touch students, so I had to get two other students to remove her. Another girl would make ahigao faces at me every day for about a week and asked if I liked it. I had no idea what it meant at the time, so I asked and she made a masturbation gesture with her hand. Another girl wore a ring around school and told people she was married. Those were the worst, but there are usually a handful of them every year. I make it a point to look unkempt now as it's super dangerous getting into these situations. I also try to have the students move to another class if possible. Most people think I should be flattered by it, but all I can think about is losing my job and being labeled a child pervert. Story 4 When I was in high school, one of my friends said how he would bang the crap out of Ms. Richards and how he wondered how big her boobs were. There were three Ms. Richards at my school, so before you go all he used her name, you would never know which one even if you knew where I went to school. Well, Ms. Richards was standing about two feet behind him when he said this. She let it pass but clearly heard it and she blushed a little and went back to her desk. The next year we were handing in our geography finals and she said, I hope you do well next year to my friend and gave him a piece of paper along with a report card that would only be altered by the test we just took. The note read 34D. He looked at her and she was smiling ear to ear. He went blood red and walked out of the room. He never did anything with her. It was just awesome. <laughs> Gross. That's, I don't, I mean, uh, just, no, the teacher should not be encouraging that. I'm certain she was flattered. And it is normal for like high school students to get crushes on teachers and people who are older than them. They're, they're getting to that point in life where they're just flooded with hormones and they're learning about that stuff. Crushes happen. Absolutely. Teachers, don't encourage that stuff with that kind of thing. Like that, I don't know, that rubs me the wrong way. No, 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 no. Story 5. There is a non-verbal, very, very large, severely autistic young man at my school who goes into a rage and attacks other teachers and students and flips tables and desks if I'm not where I am supposed to be when he wants to talk to me. I think maybe I remind him of someone else? I am a middle-aged woman with kids older than he is. He badly injured a teacher last week when I had a meeting and was not at lunch. He stares at me from across the cafeteria or gym and looks away smiling every time I look over. I'm not his teacher, and he doesn't react this way to anyone else at the school. Story 6. I had a student with a crush on me. I was in my late 20s teaching seniors in high school. He constantly emailed me with questions about college applications and stuff, but sometimes his friends would hack his account and send me emails from his account saying how much he loved me. I responded and said I cared about him, but only as a student. After he graduated high school, he would email me when he was drunk saying he loved me, then he would follow up the next morning saying he never meant to send that. I didn't really respond to those. When he graduated college, he did try to ask me out for reals, and I turned him down again politely. Story 7. Obligatory not a teacher but... 
I had a massive crush on one of my high school teachers, and I'm sure he knew. I was always finding excuses to hang around his classroom and talk to him. I wasn't the only one either. There were a handful of girls and a couple guys who would all spend our time in his vicinity. Looking back now, it was so obvious and weird that I did it, but he was my first serious crush and I had zero chill. I visited every now and then when I'd go home from college and we're still friends on Facebook still. And he's also super handsome and a genuinely nice dude. What's your, oh, rock bottom has a basement story? And how did you recover? Hey folks, just to let you know that in this video, there's going to be quite a bit of talk about people going through uh, some pretty heavy trauma and a decent bit of discussion about self-termination and ideation of that. And so if you do struggle with any of those topics, if it might be a little bit heavy for you, either go into this video mentally prepared that that's going to come up, or maybe you just might want to skip this one. Story one. After my stepdad passed away, I didn't really see my mom for three out of the four years I was in high school. Two years I lived with her. She would take off for weeks sometimes with no warning, and the other two I got passed to various families. When I was 19, I was supposed to finally move back with her when, at the last minute, she sent me to live with an aunt. The aunt's husband just opened a bakery, so I worked in the bakery as a cashier, stocking the front dishes, making the coffee, cleaning the front entirely, and frosting the donuts. He did nothing except bake. I worked 70 hours a week from 3 a.m. to as late as 6 p.m. Monday to Friday and worked Blockbuster two of those days until 10.30 p.m. I was sleeping three hours or less most nights and he would pay me approximately $1 per hour as payment for me living with them. I slept on their couch and had only a week or two worth of clothes with me. Eventually, my body started not being able to keep up the pace, and in the third month, when I pointed out the sink was leaking, he asked me why everything broke around me and why I was so useless. I responded with, I don't know, maybe it's the same reason you're an a-hole. So I got kicked out and took months to recover because I was anemic and seriously exhausted. I ended up living with a friend but didn't make a lot, so I was living off of noodles, water, and rice for months. At that time, I started dating a guy who ended up abusing me, and when I finally got the courage to break it off, he stalked me at work. The cherry on top was my dad, who had been estranged from since he walked out when I was seven, and I started trying to build a relationship again, and he emailed me that I wasn't even his, and I was the reason that my parents divorced. I did move back with my mom after that and our relationship fell apart at the news that I knew about my dad because she thought I should hate her and I didn't. She would pick fights so bad I would get bouts of IBS and have to miss work because I would vomit for six hours so violently I would pull muscles in my back, abdomen, and neck. At that point I worked full time and paid $600 in rent to my mom for a 10 by 10 room with no privacy whatsoever. I never had a substance abuse issue, but they would barge in without knocking just because they could. I wanted to throw myself in front of the train every day of the week home from work so I wouldn't have to go back. Eventually I had friends who knew I was doing bad and it was getting scary and offered to let me move in with them. I cried and said yes. They helped me get my license and my first car. My mom and I since have mended our relationship after years of talking about it and she finally understands more about my depression. My aunt divorced her a-hole baker husband. The bakery failed because he was lazy and didn't have people skills. I'm doing much better now and have a much stronger support system. I just started therapy. I even have a boyfriend who I've been with for seven years who stuck by me while I worked through my trauma and issues with my past abuse. I still have a rough time, but I'm glad I'm still here. I'm glad that this person is still here too and that they would share this story because it does go to show that there, there is a light at the end of the tunnel most of the time. You know, folks, I can't promise that everything will be great in months or years, but sometimes you got to keep going because crappy people like that in your life, you can get away from them. God, that uncle, $1 per hour in exchange for, like, the rent of the house. Like, genuinely consider that. If she had only been getting paid um, $5 an hour working 70 hours a week, that's $350 if there's not even overtime, 
which is I mean, look the math is like he's charging her over a thousand dollars for renting a couch to sleep on or something that's absurd so i am sorry for everything that this person went through and for any of you who might be going through something similar but as this person pointed out friends can be there to help other people can be there to help it can be tough but if you keep going things can get better and it's worth it Story two was sick of my job and one of the few redeeming features, my closest work colleague who worked for me in a team of two left for entirely unrelated reasons to me. We're still friends. After a long time, just feeling very alone, I split up with my long term ex who owned the house we both paid for, moved out, moved into the only flat I could afford in a quiet street where nobody would really know if I was coming and going or not. Literal assets to my name at that point, a car, a handful of personal possessions. Took out a loan to buy the most basic furniture, appliances, kept everything extremely basic, hoping to move on ASAP. I am an absolute introvert, no friends, I perform the bare minimum to, for family to stop them moaning, but otherwise I keep away from them all. Can easily go a year without seeing anyone outside of work, don't even know the neighbors' names, but they complained several times when I first moved in about all kinds of petty nonsense. Turned out that after the bills and things, I had a pittance of money each month to do anything with and nothing approaching a luxury. Minimal shopping for food, clothes, etc. for months on end. I kept the new address from everyone for as long as possible, even my employer, deliberately. I figured it would take several weeks for anyone to find me, and if it did it at the right time of year, it would only be my employer who noticed I wasn't there first and then try to trace back, which would be tricky without police help. Started writing something to explain it all, and at the bottom of the page, I had a set of boxes for all the people I wanted to say something to. After a few months of trying to finish it, there was still nothing in any of the boxes. It was a small list of names of people who might notice and be sad, but nothing in particular to say to them. Deliberately started spending time with those people in case it was the last, and even found myself leaving them on. Not quite a speech, but saying something they'd be likely to remember if they didn't see me again afterwards but worded so it wasn't seeming unusual at the time, which worked, by the way, nobody has ever suspected. A year later, still there, not quite as rock bottom as I was then, but not much better. Made a set of deadlines for, if it's not improved by then, for when I'd finish paying certain things off, having some spare money, etc. Had a couple of little free or really cheap holidays with some of the people on the list. Again, always thinking, in case that's the last time, because I don't see those people that often. Story 3. My husband lost his job and his insurance. I kid you not, the very next day he broke a rib and had to go to the ER because he didn't know what had happened. Apparently you can break your rib by sneezing really hard. Two days later, I had to go to the ER for a kidney stone. The ER thought I was drug-seeking because we had just been there with my husband, even though we refused pain medication because he didn't want it. So they sent me home. Of course, this wasn't free, and they were really mean about it while I was trying to take severe pain like a champ and not cry because no one believed me. The next day, I had thrown up so much from the pain that it damaged my esophagus and started throwing up blood. My throat felt like it was on fire, and I couldn't breathe properly. We googled it, and every website said, Get your butt to the ER! So we went back. I won't go into that experience, but we basically had to beg the ER staff to see me after I had laid on the floor outside of triage in and out of consciousness for six hours. After they finally told me what had happened, they sent me home. I was still puking blood and in horrible pain from the kidney stone. It didn't get better. I didn't want to go back to the hospital after they had failed to help me twice in the same week, so I went to the urgent care instead. They said they weren't equipped to deal with my problem, but I told them what the hospital had done and begged them to try. They gave me an IV, pain medication, anti-nausea medication, and a couple of other things, and effing finally, I was able to go home and recover. And then the hospital bills started coming. The hospital didn't do jack crap to help my problem, but five years later, I am still paying for it. I can't remember how much it cost because it came as a series of separate bills, but probably as much as our house. <sighs> I get so mad about, like, hospitals and medical places like this where them kicking this woman out because they're like, oh, they're just after drugs. Like, they exacerbated this problem, didn't help this person out at all, and then billed her an obscene amount of money. And they weren't even the ones to fix, you know, to help heal her in the end. I feel like she should be able to, like, go to court and be like, 
yeah, they turned me away, didn't fix the problem, and charged me an absurd amount of money. Other people had to fix me. Here's the proof. I don't owe them anything because they screwed up. This, oh my gosh. And boy, oh boy, if you can't tell that this person is almost 1,000% in the U.S. healthcare system, oh, then I envy you. Story four. Caught my abusive drug addict boyfriend cheating on me a few nights before we were supposed to move into a new apartment. He raged and chucked me out of both apartments. I stayed with friends and at shelters while working three jobs to get back on my feet. Had a hard time finding housing, was struggling with PTSD because not only did he turn on me, the entire community I had built and the time I was with him did too. Even my own friends. Women were coming to me for months afterwards with confessions. I was also trying to stay sober during this time. Had nobody, was estranged from my family, wanted to die. Eventually found housing with one of my remaining friends, adopted a cat, and worked really hard to replace all my furniture. The apartment was crap, but it was the first place I had felt safe in years. Fast forward two years, I'm still working a lot, but live in a nicer place now. I have better friends and don't suffer with PTSD so much. My ex's actions still haunt me, but I'm a lot stronger and trust myself and my instincts more now. And I'm still sober. Mothers, what moments have made you want to punch a child? Story 1. My own kid is one, so he hasn't really given me a proper chance to want to give him a smacking yet, but I have plenty of other children's stories. Note that not all of these occur after motherhood happened. 1. Years ago, when three of our cousins came to stay with us for a night while my mom and her sister went out. This almost never happened because my mom was the mean mom and my cousins didn't like coming over. Almost immediately, the older two, then 13 and 16, went searching through the fridge looking for alcohol. I, then 15, managed to get some kind of order when the youngest cousin, then 10, thought it would be funny to take my little brother, then 4, into the basement, book it up the stairs, and shut the door while turning the light off. I came out of the kitchen and could hear my brother screaming and pounding on the door while my cousin held it shut and laughed. I didn't punch him, but I did slam him into the wall and tell him, not to try that crap again. 2. D.H. and I were at one of those temporary Halloween stores with a friend and his oldest kid, then 4 or 5. Kid had picked up one of those ugly rubber nightmare babies and was walking around with it when a girl, probably 8 or 9, walked up and basically wrestled it out of his hands. As she went to walk away, I snatched it back from her and loudly said, don't take that from him. She looked at me like she wanted to hit me, and honestly, I would have smacked her back. Three, different cousin. We were staying the weekend at my grandparents with the entire cousin bunch. A group of us were in the back room talking and perusing my grandma's collection of romance novels when I, then 17, smelled something burning. I look over to see one of my cousins, 14 or 15, using a lighter to burn the edges of grandma's antique lace curtains. She was shocked when I B-slapped her and told her to stop being a disrespectful craphead. I mean, I guess you were old enough that this kind of counts, you know? I mean, I feel like a mother wanting to hit their kid is a, a whole different ball game, but, uh, yeah, no, these seems like, uh, some justified, uh, angers and, uh, you handled things in a way that I think any teenager might handle them. Uh, probably not me. I was I was very non-confrontational and shy for the most part. I did now? Well, let's not get into that. Story two. I know you're asking moms, but I'm a dad and remember this one story and had to share. My son was being picked on at the bus stop by some other kids, and despite my son being taller, he always tried to shy away from any kind of altercations. He always asked slash told them to stop, and he would just move away from them. One day, the two bullies start picking on a little girl, and my son defiantly told them to stop. Alas, they didn't listen and punched my son. This is where I wanted to drop kick the kids. He immediately retaliated and kicked one in the groin and punched the other in the throat. Of course, right after that, the mom came running out of her house saying my son was a bully, which wasn't the case, and even more so that other kids all dimed her kids out. I don't condone violence typically, but we've told our kids to defend themselves appropriately, and this was a proud parent moment for us. 
Story three, not a mom, but a big sister. I broke my ankle recently and have to walk with crutches. My sister always throws whatever she's carrying on the ground in front of the steps to get inside, which is hard enough to go up the steps since I don't have good balance in the first place. So leaving her crap on the floor right in the middle of where I need to walk and not moving it when I ask. I couldn't care less and just pick it up and move it myself if I wasn't on crutches, especially when I'm home alone and I try walking and I just trip over a big butt bag she left in the middle of the hallway and have trouble getting back up, since there's nothing for me to really hold on to and crawling hurts. I don't like people helping me much anyway, but she's been extra crabby and unhelpful now that I actually need it, that with a few other things makes me want to smack her upside the head with my crutches as hard as I can. Really not getting the mom stories that I expected here. I mean, this just seems like normal sibling anger and stuff going on here. Where are the moms? The moms who are just losing it and want to just punt their kid across a field like the Hulk punted that military guy in that Hulk movie. You know, the one with Edward uh, Norton Hulk. Remember? That was a good moment. What were we talking about? <laughs> Story 4. When my son was four, my husband and I took him on a short walk around a local lake. He was loving it and having a great time, but he kept running ahead of us. This wasn't an issue until we came off the trail into a sidewalk near the highway. I asked him to come back to us several times, and he kept running forward. A line of traffic was headed our way, so I jogged up and picked him up from behind. That little crap lost his mind, turned his head back to look at me directly in the eyes, and then threw an elbow right into my face. I have never before or since been that angry at a child. My husband ran up and grabbed him out of my arms and hustled him to the car while I stood there seething. I stood there for probably 10 minutes before I felt like it was safe for me to be around my kid again. My husband still likes to tell my now 11-year-old about how he single-handedly saved his life when mom was about to throw him into oncoming traffic. I'm pretty sure if I tried something like that as a kid, I might have... Might have gotten spanked. I was spanked a little as a kid. Not great. Don't condone it. Um, but, you know, my mom was trying. It was the 80s. But uh, I think the other punishment, though, that my mom would have done is she would have stopped asking me what I wanted to eat and would have just served me plates of canned spinach or something and been like, ha ha ha, not kidding. Eat it. Story five. When my daughter went through a just kidding phase... We'd ask her what she wanted for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and every time we had finished cooking it and gave it to her, she would say, Just kidding, I want this instead, and then proceed to throw a fit when we said we would not make her something else. Honestly, I think every mom deserves at least one free splashing water in a kid's face moment. Like, kids are awful sometimes. I mean, they're supposed to be, kind of, I guess, you know, but like... I think of some of the stuff I put my mom through and what my siblings did and all that. And yeah, a mom should get a freebie like that. Maybe even like once a year. <laughs> Story six. My daughter threw my cat down the stairs. I almost lost my crap on her. She had a hard time in time out and is still grounded from playing with the cats. Story seven. Not a mother, not my child, but my cousin took my glasses off my face when he was four and proceeded to snap them in half. I was 16. I was broke at the time and couldn't get new ones. I cried because I value my sight more than anything and can barely see without them. Plus, they were my first pair and I had only had them for like five months after being blind for so long. Auntie told me it's my fault for letting him take them even though my hands were full and I was expecting it. I almost went back downstairs and volleyed both him and his six-year-old sister who instigated it. Instead, I screamed at her and left the house to calm down and bawled my eyes out. I didn't get another pair of glasses until like a year later when my college teacher paid for them. I'm 19 now and that still enrages me when I think about it. What's the worst thing you've accidentally texted to the wrong person? Story one, not a text exactly, but a text that turned to a call with the same outcome. Very long night of drinking in the city, which spilled into the morning. Got back to my friends in Jersey and needed to get home upstate almost one and a half hours one way by early afternoon to walk my dogs, since my parents got delayed and couldn't. Obviously, I wasn't going to make it in my current state. Was talking to this girl Casey at the time more than I was Casey. 
texted Casey thinking it was KC and got annoyed she didn't understand some of what I was saying. Called her and explained I knew she had to work later but I needed a huge favor. She was confused and asked who I thought it was on the phone and I said, Casey, we were together the other night. To which she replied, uh, right name, wrong girl. I hung up. Needless to say, me and Casey didn't get very far, lol. Called Casey and it all went way better than expected. Sorry, Casey. Uh, so here you thought that Casey was up to bat and uh, it was a swing and a miss. Someone's gonna get that reference. I hope. Maybe. <laughs> also, I, it took me a while to realize that those were different spellings of a name and not typos, so mm, hopefully my delivery of that doesn't confuse people like it confused me. Story 2. After three miscarriages and then a horribly complicated pregnancy with our son, I was warned never to have another child. I had an IUD inserted. It works well for almost three years, but that morning I had tested positive on a home pregnancy test. I had to go to the doctor immediately because if you get pregnant on an IUD, the risk of an ectopic pregnancy is high. I started miscarrying while waiting for the blood tests to come back. Of course, my partner was worried about me, so I texted them as I left the clinic. Well, it doesn't effing matter if it's ectopic or not, I'm having yet another miscarriage. Goddamn, I'm, am I good at killing babies. Except I accidentally sec sent the text to my mother-in-law. Oh. A, my heart just breaks for this person having to go through, you know, all those miscarriages and the panic and the fear and everything. Like, oh my gosh. And then to pile on top of that, the just mortification I'm sure you must have felt sending that to your mother-in-law. I hope that your mother-in-law is just a really rad understanding person and didn't hold it against you because who could? I think at that point you're allowed to say whatever the hell you want. But even still, my sympathies to this person wherever they are. Story three. Man, you gay as F, to my professor who turned out to be a homosexual when it was meant to be sent to my friend because he texted me that he just saw Matthew Perry in person and he was freaking out. My professor didn't reply or anything, so I assumed he just ignored it. When I got into his class the next day, I pretended not to know anything, and after a while, I just thought he forgot about it. But at the end of class, he called me and asked how'd I know he was gay. I told him I didn't mean anything bad and had just texted the wrong person, so naturally, awkwardness ensued. Long story short, he never talked to me again, but gave me a grade higher than I deserved. Story 4. Not exactly texted, but iCloud transfer. My girlfriend at the time had wanted a picture of my D. I had never taken a D-pic before, so, eh, why not? So I took the pic and sent it to my girlfriend. The next day, I'm with my girlfriend and my dad calls me. I answer and he's like, why the F does your mom have a picture of your D on her phone? This was no ordinary picture either. I was laying on my back, got an erection, and propped my D up nice and straight and put the camera beneath my D with my face in the background. It was some good crap. Turns out they had just set up iCloud that day, and I had used my dad's credit card for music most recently, so my phone was hooked up to their iCloud, and I had no idea. I couldn't look my mom in the eyes for a while. Well, well, well. If I didn't need yet another reason to stick to Android, this is it right here. I definitely don't want to be sending pictures of my wiener to my mom. She especially... No, no, oh, like... There should be no way that that happens. I just, I'm very upset by this. <laughs> Story five. I don't remember all the details because it was a long time ago, but uh, too long didn't read naked pic of girlfriend to dad. I had the picture saved in some weird place in order to hide them, but I couldn't get them to cover the full screen, so I would text them to myself. It was an old crappy touchscreen phone, the kind that used a grid and pressure. When I was scrolling down to me and the contacts, it selected my dad as a recipient on the way down. I managed to go full ninja, convince my mom to drive me to his house by saying it was a very angry text meant for a friend that I was embarrassed about, got in and deleted it before he woke up. P.S. I don't remember how old I was, but apparently not old enough to drive, at least not without an adult in the passenger seat. Story 6. 
I have a horrible slash hilarious slash awesome history of sending texts to the wrong person. Most are pretty harmless, like once I was really sick and bedridden for two weeks. My significant other was taking care of me, so I texted her, she was downstairs, and asked her if she could bring me some green tea. I accidentally sent it to my mate, and he actually brought it. But some are very naughty. I was friends with benefits with this girl from back home, and I was across the planet at the time, so we, uh, intimately texted a lot. I meant to send her a D-pic, but sent it to this girl I met a few days ago. I started freaking out because I legitimately liked this girl and wanted to date her. Thinking I just murdered my chances with her, I started texting an apology, but she sent me a nude back. I'm marrying this woman in February. My mate from the first story is going to be my best man. There's nothing at all horrible about this story. You did, you you send a text and you you had a friend who did a wonderful thing for you and apparently made your friendship closer, and then you sent a a picture of your dingle dangle to some girl you were interested in, and she sent you a picture of her whoozy what's it, and now and now you're getting married. This is a great story, folks. Turns out, just sometimes send. Uh, no, no, no. Not gonna encourage people to send. Don't send naked pictures to anyone ever. That's my advice, please. Story seven. Back in college, in my group house, we had a tradition in which we roasted the departing members each year. Non-native speakers. Roast in this context means to make fun of someone in front of an audience. One guy's approach to the roast was that the woman being roasted always got good news, so he was going to give her some bad news. He asked me to text her in the middle of the roast, you are HIV positive. No problem, I'm happy to help out. Then during the roast, the moment of truth arrives and I clandestinely hit send on my Nokia 2100. Seconds pass, nothing. The roaster asked the roastee if she had her phone on her, but she didn't. So that's why she didn't get a text notice, I thought. Turns out she had also changed her phone number, and a couple hours later I get a response back, Who the F is this? Story 8. First year of university, and I was walking to my drug dealer's house for the first time alone. He was just a nice-looking bro looking to make money for groceries, so I never had a reason to be afraid of him, but it was pretty late at night, so I was texting my roommate to sort of ease my anxiety. Made small talk with his bro roommates until the deed was done. When I left, I texted my roommate, The eagle has landed, and I wasn't even as assaulted. Before I could put my phone away, I got a text from my dealer. What? Just a bunch of good guys here, haha. <laughs> Called my weed dealer plus his friends, Aurists, and they continue to be pretty cool after that. Shout out to Pat. Story 9. Yeah, get the boat ready. I just told my boss I was sick and won't be in today. To my boss. It is worth noting that my boss was cool about it and responded with, Bass fever, huh? Seriously? That's a good boss. That's a reaction a boss should have because, you know what? Yeah, sometimes you need, you just need to be able to take a mental health day. And what's better for your mental health than fishing? Unless you're me, and you're also very bad at fishing, and it's frustrating. But still, it's nice to sit on a boat. Story 10. Texted my straight male friend, You make me so unbelievably hard. Intended for my girlfriend. He just went with it, assuming I was joking with him. Story 11. Texted my high school football coach, Good night, I love you, as a freshman. Intended for my girlfriend. He made me run extra at practice the next day for telling a girl I loved her as a freshman. Life lesson learned. Story 12. I went on a date with this girl. It was very boring. However, I could tell she thought it was going great. We said goodbye and I was on my way. A few hours later, a friend texted and asked me how the date went. I texted with an entire paragraph of why the date sucked and why I didn't like her. I got a question mark, question mark as a response. To my horror, I texted the very girl I had just gone on the date with. It was extremely embarrassing, but the girl said she appreciated the honesty. Oh, uh, no, no. Oh, I'm all for honesty in even just like after a first date. Honesty, open communication, very good. Tact and proper delivery are important, however, and I'm sure that that was just unpleasant for both of you. But hey, glad it turned out okay. 
Professors, have you ever been pressured or forced to pass an athlete or other student by your athletics department or university administration? How did that go? Story 1. The University of California at Berkeley. As a varsity-level athlete for Cal, I feel my input is relative to the topic, even though I am obviously not a professor. Although no, no documented cases of teachers passing athletes without doing their work exist at our school that I'm aware of, I can tell you quite a bit about some of the ways that the system of student-athletes bypasses the student part more than we would like to admit. The first thing to take into account is that the revenue-producing sports of basketball and football are the most egregious offenders, although each sport team is not without its own set of dirty laundry. There's no sugarcoating the truth. Our admission standard, GAs, and graduation rates for student-athletes are all far below the average for the school as a whole. For those who don't want to read the article, here are the most important takeaway points. 55% of male athletes graduate compared to 88% overall. 80% of female athletes graduate compared to 92% overall athletes with a minimum average of 370 out of 800 for each section of the SATs are accept the SAT are accepted. Non-athletes have a bottom quarter quartile average of 640 out of 800 per section. 1,110 out of 2,400 for athletes compared to the bottom quartile of the students with a score of 1,950 out of 2,400. Cal has the lowest graduation rate for both football and basketball players of any of the 72 public schools where records are public information in the NCAA Division I category. We graduate only about one-third of basketball players and about 43% of football players. The statistics are terrible, as I said originally, but to me, the true picture is painted by the anecdotal evidence. These graduation rates are happening when the tutoring services available to us as athletes are not just comprehensive, but frankly can border on the lines of cheating. Many players who are deemed in need of help receive personal attention each day, sometimes twice a day before major tests or projects. I will say before we continue with this story in the next story, an interesting way of doing things, didn't know that there was a character limit this short. Um, I will say that uh, the whole thought of like teachers passing athletes without doing their work uh, doesn't, that doesn't exist. There's no documented cases. Of course they're not. They're not supposed to do it. You don't document that stuff. <laughs> that stuff that's a terrible paper trail to have and as an athlete and not a professor i would especially expect you to not be aware of that um otherwise all the statistics and stuff that you have are very interesting i think you know the rest of it's very well thought out i just had to point that out like yeah you know no documented cases of cheating i mean not not that I would hope not, but I would imagine not. <laughs> story 2! Still part of story 1, I guess. Following the previous comment, the only two groups of people eligible for priority class registration are athletes and regents scholars, an extremely rare honor worth a full education. This means that as athletes we get any of the classes and times we want to accommodate for our practice schedules, and still our GAs are lower on average. Again, speaking anecdotally here about the majors the a average athlete declares in do not seem to be nearly as difficult as as the average student. Not just standard liberal arts degrees either. Most of my fellow athletes pick majors that already have the highest average graduation rates on campus and still struggle. Finally, and most importantly in my opinion, is the nonchalance that seems to pervade our entire organization of Cal Athletics. Athletes just don't seem to care about being at Berkeley nearly as much as the average student. Again, this is my opinion, and my opinion alone represented here, and I base it off nothing but anecdotal evidence, but many of my peers seem to take for granted the opportunity to get a degree from Cal, and I view this as the most shameful part of our athletic culture. In conclusion, our athletic department needs a serious overhaul. The new football head coach, Sonny Dykes, has already made tremendous strides, but he will need more support from our athletic director, or in my opinion, a new athletic director. Coach Dykes took over from Jared Tedford, and most of these statistics come from data collected during his tenure. 
Already in his first semester as head coach, Dykes had posted the highest football team GPA average in our program's history. I can also personally attest to multiple new team rules that seem to help the situation. For example, no football player can sit beyond the eighth row in a lecture hall. Many of us athletes in non-revenue producing sports also don't have many of these problems to the same degree. In fact, some sports have even higher graduation rates and GAs than the average student at Cal. The fact remains as they are for now, though, and they are not up to what I personally believe should be the standard for an institution with as much of a history, reputation, and opportunity for success such as Cal. Really got that uh, University of California Berkeley pride going on in this post, which is fine. You know, you want to have pride in your own school, but... I mean, I think it's important to get an education in whatever university or college you happen to go to. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I think we could get into a whole discussion here about how, like, the people who want to get into pro sports, they have to, like, really stand out and be the best of the best. You know, the competition for that stuff is phenomenal. And typically, they have to focus on it to such a degree that they're not going to be able to focus on schoolwork as much. And so it's this kind of weird balance where schools have tried to be like, well, you've got to at least maintain such and such GPA and attend so, so many classes. But... Even with the colleges saying that, on the other side, they're also like, but also give 110% to sports. And I don't know what the answer is. I feel like they've been trying and it's not working great. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if people who want to be professional in sports should, uh, you know, have as much focus in the sports and should have a backup with college, or maybe they should have the right to just completely devote themselves to the sport. I mean, it's their life. I don't know. It's such a weird mixed up thing. And obviously not something that I am <laughs> qualified to talk about much. So let's move on. Story three. Not a professor, but taught a couple of courses as an undergrad as part of some neat butt program. I flunked one of our star basketball players and had turned in my grades about a week before grades were due. When going back to make sure I had done everything, I noticed that his grade was magically unflunked and switched to a B-. I didn't ask any questions because I really didn't care, and the kid did put in lots of extra effort meeting with me to try to get his grades up. He just sucked at the subject. Also, I flunked a student who was the son of a professor in the same department I was working in. She flipped crap somehow, got the chair of the department to agree to let him retake two out of three exams and two out of four essays. The chair then coached me on how to make sure he still flunked, and we designed these special new exams together, making the questions something that I could answer, but no way any of my students could unless they just had an uncanny knack for the field. I ended up flunking his butt in the end, but a year later I had to take one of her courses on stats. She couldn't flunk me for two reasons. I had over a 100% on all of my exams and coursework up to the final, and everyone in the course as well as their chair knew that. However, she claimed that I failed the final and ended up giving me a C-plus in the course. The chair and I tried to challenge this knowing it was a load of BS, but she won in the end. After making some appeal to the effing dean which did not allow us to view the test scores. I'm now happily in graduate school for that field, and the chair went out of his way to explain that particular discrepancy on my transcripts when I applied. I also received an A-plus on the part two of the stats course taught by a different professor. F you, Dr. Mason. Story four. My last semester at college, I TA'd for an upper-level psych course, and the majority of the school's basketball took the class. My assumption was it was one of the few taught by a black male professor, so they thought they didn't have to try very hard. From the emails they sent to protest grades, this became apparent. All but one of the players rarely came to class and missed some exams. When they did take exams, it was obvious the players were nowhere near college-level education. Their answers read about third-grade level. I ended up flunking four of the five, with one sending me constant emails about how unfair it was since he was going to lose his eligibility to play. After speaking it over with my professor, he offered a one-time-only makeup exam that was only offered to the players. None showed. 
In his last game he played, he beat the crap out of one of his rivals during a small fight at the game. He literally stomped on his head in front of the news cameras. Awkward. 5. My dad taught radio, TV, and film in the 70s at UMCP. He had several members of the Terps athletic program in his classes. The one story he always tells is about getting a visit during his office hours at the end of a spring semester from two muscled coach types. They came in and started talking about one particular student and his performance in my dad's class. Dad knew who they were on about. He was somewhat of a mini-celebrity on campus. He played on the defensive line for the Maryland Terrapins football team. He's going to pass, right? They asked my dad. No, he never comes to class, he never does any of the assignments, and he's failed every test he's ever taken. Well, if he doesn't pass, they replied, we'd probably have to rough you up. Maybe we could show you how we break legs or something. Think about it, and we're sure you'll do the right thing. They left, and my dad gave the athlete a D, which is barely passing. The student athlete went on to be drafted in the first round of the NFL draft and had a storied career playing for an iconic American football team. Certainly, the student didn't have anything to do with the threats of some selfish coaches. I won't name names, but you wonder if all the years of Pro Bowl awards and a Super Bowl championship ring would have come to that guy if my dad hadn't let him pass? <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I mean... It wouldn't have been funny in the moment, but I do have to chuckle at the idea of friggin', you know, coach mafia hitman or whatever who's just like, I don't know, maybe he passes the class or uh, maybe we find out which directions your legs are actually able to bend. I know what I'm saying here, professor. <laughs> it's kind of cartoonish, but I mean, I'm certain in the moment, genuinely very frightening. And also... Folks, you gotta calm down a little bit. Sports can be important to you, that's fine, but not, not that important. Story 6. My uncle used to teach at a Big 12 university. He had weekly quizzes and he dropped the lowest three at the end of the term, including ones with zeros due to not showing up. Consequently, no makeup quizzes were offered. A bunch of football players signed up for his course and he warned them about the weekly quizzes because they would miss more than three classes due to games. My uncle had someone from the athletic department yelling at him on the phone at the end of the term when none of the players passed. Apparently, the athletes rarely came to class even when they weren't away for games and didn't score high enough on exams to make up the points deficit. What's a harmless slash non-serious secret you've kept forever? Story 1. My mom was a crystal addict. So my siblings and I grew up with very little. Normally she would pull her head out of her butt long enough around the holiday season to sign up with a church or charity to get us a food box and some presents. However, by the time I was 11, she was so far gone we could go weeks without seeing her leave her room or her be completely gone from the house. I entered a drawing contest at my school around this time. I won a $100 gift certificate to our local mall. One day after making sure my siblings made it to school, I played hooky and walked to the mall about three and a half miles. I bought my siblings some presents, almost forgot to get myself something, and ended up buying some discounted body wash. Then had them wrapped there at the mall before trekking home. I hid the presents in the crawl space till the 24th. I was right, our mom did nothing. When my siblings were distracted by a movie, I snuck out and put the box of presents on the front porch before knocking and running away. I snuck back in the back door by the bathroom and heard my siblings yelling, Someone left a box on the porch that says Merry Christmas. I had also spent the last week before Christmas break going door to door asking for canned food donations, saying it was for a food drive at my church. I didn't have a church. So that we didn't spend the whole winter break hungry. I'm so glad all four of us made it out of our childhood and not one of us took the same path as the woman who birthed us. Crap, man. This hits close to home. Drugs do things to people that no child should ever have to see. I was lucky to be the ignorant third child asking why Dad had to talk with me before he left forever. My mom was shocked. I knew she and my great-grandpa kicked him, but I didn't understand till much later he was kicked out because of the drugs and me telling my gramps, Can you keep my birthday money till we get to the store? If Mom keeps it, Dad takes and buys his funny stuff, but I really want something this time. Stories like this are this weird emotional mix because it's 
really, really sweet that this person was able to do that for their siblings, to give them a little bit of joy around the holiday season. But it is also unbelievably heartbreaking to hear about an 11 year old having to do this to make sure that these kids didn't go without. And I'm also extremely happy to hear that all four of them made it out of that childhood. I hope that they're all doing okay. And I hope for any of the rest of you out there, I just genuinely hope that you don't have to go through something like this. Story two. I used to live in a dorm hall when I was an undergrad. There was this one guy in the dorms who had a mat outside his door. I always thought it was a little weird because, one, you had to walk a long way through carpet to get to the door, so your shoes would surely be mostly clean by that point, and two, anyone could just simply take it. I kind of just assumed someone would steal it eventually, but after about a month, I noticed it was still there. I obviously wasn't going to steal someone's stuff, but I did want to mess with it, so I simply moved it to the door across the hall. The next day, I saw it had been moved back, so I decided to move it across the hall again. I did this for an entire year. Sometimes they'd give up and leave it at the other door for a week, then I'd just move it back to F with them. I loved the idea that it surely led to some sort of argument between the two neighbors because nobody is going to think some guy is just randomly deciding to F with them for no reason. I literally never met either of the people that lived in those rooms. I just kept messing with their mat. I had some special moments with it too. On Christmas, I replaced the mat with a Christmas one and then put the original one back the next day. On Easter, I bought the cheapest, crappiest Easter basket I could find and filled it with granny candies like Werther's and those strawberry candies. Then I hid it under the mat. At one point, I bought a second mat to just sometimes put at both doors, then take the second one away randomly. Eventually, I moved into an apartment and couldn't mess with them anymore. They never got to find out what the F was going on. I mean, as far as pranks go, that's pretty fun. And you did do some like cute, quirky, fun stuff where I think if I had had that mat, it would have started to get a little bit irritating. But the moment that you did the Christmas mat and the Easter basket, I would have been like, I don't know who's doing this, but thank you. Thank you for just every day giving me something to look forward to. <laughs> Story three, my mom won a prize from Sirius XM at the beginning of the pandemic that never arrived even after she followed up. She had been so excited to win something for the first time that I finally found a record store with the items she won, paid for them, and arranged with them to use a generic shipping label and include an apology for the delay and congratulations for winning the label. She loves her prize and forgives them for the delay. Damn, I used to work at Sirius XM. I wonder who in the promotions department completely effed this up. A few times, if they were holding contests where you had to be the nth caller, I'd be the one answering the phone, and I was always so super stoked whenever I got the winning caller and gave the news that they won. Best feeling in the world! The person was always completely speechless and blown away that they actually won. I'd hate to know that maybe sometimes these people never actually got what they won. Story 4 First marriage to my last wife. On the day of the wedding, the ring got stolen out of my car. I was freaking out. My two best men went into overdrive and took a picture I had of the ring and went to I don't know how many jewelry stores, explained what had happened, and if they had a ring that was similar. They went to this really great jewelry maker and said, I have something that's really close, give me a bit and I can make it perfect. He worked his butt off and got it done with about an hour to spare, plus he managed to get my window fixed. The three of us are the only ones who know. I ended up using that jewelry maker for any jewelry I needed, and well, I haven't stopped yet. He ended up telling my best man to not worry about the price and for me to come down after the honeymoon to work it out. I did, and he gave it to me at the cost of the materials. He is a great guy. He retired during COVID. That dude got referred customers all day. Story 5 in 2009, my best friend was struggling to pay rent when his TV broke, so I wanted to buy him a 42-inch HD TV for over $1,000. I knew he would never accept me spending that much as a gift. So I took it out of the box and put a few small scratches on the back of it and told him I bought a new TV and that he could have my old one that I didn't use anymore. Well, he's doing way better now financially, but he has no idea I did that, and I will never tell him. You are one heck of an amazing friend. And 
Yeah, I mean, I, I know how that would go. Like, if a friend offered to buy me a $1,000 TV when I was worse off, I would have been like, absolutely not. You can't do that. No way. No way. But, hey, good on you. You uh, you got clever with it and uh, helped someone out. And that's really awesome. And you've, uh, you know, never tried to cash in on that in any way. So, yeah, I think more people should be like you. Story six. When my brother was four, he won a stuffed animal from a claw machine, and it was his favorite thing ever. Slept with it every night for weeks. He fell asleep on the couch and was carried to bed, but left his stuffed animal on the floor, and the dog decided to tear it to pieces during the night. I spent $40 trying to win another one and put it under his bed for him to find. After reading this kind of story and different iterations for years, I think the key for parents is to get like five of a favorite toy and secretly relocate them like they do for panda parents. That way all of them get equally loved slash worn down and a replacement for a lost one doesn't look new. Story 7. As a previous nanny, I've seen many first steps and heard many first words, but I never share that. When I leave, I say something like, I think the little one is so close to walking slash talking. It's a special moment parents deserve. Who am I to take that from them? One baby was walking with me for a full two weeks before he showed his new trick to his parents. We did that at the daycare I worked at, lol. I remember specifically one time this kid had been walking all day. His mom came in to pick him up, and my grandmother, who ran the place, sat him down really fast so she wouldn't see. When his mom rounded the corner, he stood up and walked to her, and the look on her face was priceless. She was so excited. I don't, nor would I want to work with children uh, well, of any age, uh, but I would never have thought of something like this, and that's just, that's just so sweet. It's just such a small thing, but yeah, it's kind of a big deal for parents getting to see those first steps and those first words. Like, they only have that once, and especially if you only have the one kid, that's like a momentous occasion. You only get to enjoy that that one first time, and I've seen some people who are like, ah, oh, it's not such a big deal, whatever, but no, I mean, I get it. I might not have kids, but I do get it. Story 8. In 1998, I had a friend who was stuck in a very toxic situation at her home. She had an opportunity for a new start across the country in Oregon. She had a Dodge Neon that was hanging on for dear life and decided to pass on the opportunity for fear the car wouldn't make the trip. I told her I had a friend that was a mechanic that owed me a favor and he would give the car a tune-up for free. I didn't really have a friend that was a mechanic. We were both 18 with not much money, but I used all of my savings to pay to have her car made roadworthy for the trip. She's a mother of four now with a great job and thriving in Oregon. Story 9. My friend is a major, major Death Cab for Cutie fan. They came to our city a couple years ago, and I knew she wouldn't be able to afford the tickets to go. She was upbeat about it, but I know she was devastated by it. I bought tickets. Two days before the show, I told her that the friend I originally planned to take couldn't go, and would she please come with me? There was no other friend. Told her I loved the band and would be sad to miss them. She of course accepted and had the time of her life. She's doing much better now, but every couple of Christmases or birthdays, she gets me some Death Cab merchandise because she knows how much I love the band. I can't stand their music. I literally have them blocked on Spotify, but now it's gone too far where I can't tell her. Please leave your story in the comments. I would love to make a video on them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.